I'm glad to be here. This is my third time here. I sort of check in every eight or nine months just to let everybody know how my organization's doing. I know that you two talked about how you're interested in Africa. That's great. I, I love the topic. I'm super happy to talk about Africa on and on and on and on. Um, before I start, I should uh, maybe catch you all up on... Usually what I do is I show up and I tell you like what we've done recently, but I'm going to tell you like just sort of the whole history a little bit. Uh, like, uh, to answer, for example, I'll answer the question, why are we in Africa? As you know, Africa is the most religious continent, right? And it's full of all kinds of religious problems. Like, uh, there's like a line like right through the middle of Africa, uh, Christians in the, in the south, Muslims in the north, and there's, you know, constant battles going on there between all kinds of uh, extremist groups. Uh, but also the worst religion in Africa, which we don't hear about that often, is actually traditional African religions, uh, basically witchcraft, and that's, uh, that's uh, something that we work against a lot. And by that I mean uh, witch doctors who do things like uh, tell the village they have to throw a albino in the volcano or the volcano will erupt, things like this. Or there's a lot of, we have helped uh, albinos quite a bit because there's a lot of persecution of, al of albinos. And the witch doctors are, you know, a pretty terrible menace. But also Christianity and Islam in Africa is worse than Christianity and Islam and perhaps any other place. Just the ex extremism there. Okay, so I'm going to start right in. Uh, this is going to be kind of fun for me. Uh, my nonprofit's always telling me, Hank, don't always talk about the problems and the corruption in, uh, in Africa. Don't do that constantly, and I, but I'm going to do that quite a bit today because, uh, because I enjoy it and I, and I kind of want to pass on to everybody. Like when you're thinking about donating to an organization, you might have some questions about, you know, uh, is, it, is this really working? Uh, and is funding this particular thing really valuable? Um, so I will be talking about how, you know, places that we have either, we've, we've never really totally failed, but we've sort of half failed in doing certain enterprises. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about that. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so this is what we have done. This is how we kind of started and what we did and what we thought we would always do and what we're no longer doing, okay? And I'm going to explain, like, why we're no longer doing it. So in four years, basically from 2015 to now, we built two humanist preschools, three humanist primary schools, two humanist secondary schools. We also built, we didn't build them, but we set up uh, 15 clinics and two orphanages. And that sounds phenomenal, and I'm really great we did it. And we did it, and it cost way more money than it probably should have. And my question uh, that I'm going to be talking about is, is this an effective way to promote humanism, okay, by building these schools? Does anybody see any ways that, that maybe it would not be an effective way? Uh, anybody have any ideas? Before I start in and tell you all the ways it's not, go ahead. Why would it not be effective? Schools are one-on-one, -on -one, uh, so you have less leverage than if you do something that affects millions of people. Wow, I haven't even, I haven't even thought of that. Yeah, we like to do the one-on-one -on -one stuff because we offer a tremendous amount of transparency. Like if somebody gives us $44, I show them that I mailed the $44 to such and such person, and then that person sends back a photograph of themselves holding a sign saying, thank you for the 44 You know, so we do the one-on-one -on -one thing a lot because uh, funders seem to like it. Uh, okay, go ahead. Would, oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, thank you. I'm not sure how much the parents and their kids who are going there would even pay attention to the message. Exactly. You know, they'd be very grateful maybe for learning to read or whatever, but yeah. could care less about humanism. Yeah. I'm going to be talking a lot about that. That's probably, that's probably the most disappointing thing, that we can build all these schools and everybody can go to the schools and everybody can graduate and everybody can go to the PTO meetings and they'll just forget about the humanism because they're there for the math and the English and the social life or because the school was across the block. Uh, go ahead. Hold on, Stick. Yeah, here it comes. I can see a bump in the road for it because like religious groups, there's a conversion element going on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that is true. I'm going to talk about that too. I'm going to go in and start. Oh, so here's what we did. This is a show. You know, all of the buildings that we built were built out of brick. Oh, and this is fun, you know, because we get to show like, oh, look, the building that you paid for. Like, we got most of our classrooms built for between $1,000 and $1,200. And a lot of them are individual donors. And so we get to show them all these pictures. And here's some of what we built. This is, uh, this is the first one we built. This is the Zoha Orphanage Humanist Primary School. And there's somebody, Dr. Bruce Chow. He, he bought about four buildings. This is the Karen Zelovinsky. She's the, she's the nonprofit president. She bought, gee, probably six buildings. And who's this? Uh, oh, that's Bruce Chow again. I don't know. I must be going the wrong way. Okay. Here we go. And yeah, and this is Cajandero. That's the second school we built. The guy we work with in Kasese in western Uganda is brilliant. He always puts the school uh, surrounded by like a lot of farmland that he owns. And so the kids always have food. And we bought him like a tractor. Okay, so, so this is, I think, yes, that's the head teacher at Bazoha. This is the most, this is the second to the last one we built. This is Kasisi Humanist Secondary School. Uh, you know, this is one of my, our gimmicks. We say we're going to name it after, we're going to name the library after uh, Christopher Hitchens. So this is for actually the most recently one, recent one we built, uh, Brighter Brains Humanist Secondary School in a town called Kanunga. There it is. We got a bunch of money from the Freethinker magazine. Anybody know that magazine? So they helped us build uh, a Freethinker library. So now I'm going to be talking about the five huge problems with this approach. Projects go way over budget. Has anybody here, most people here have run a business. You know how terrible it is when the projects go way over budget. Or even if you like remodel your home and the project goes, you know, where's that money coming from? So uh, we have built six schools. First one went about double over budget. Second one was fine. We, we, that one didn't go over budget. That was called Cajandero. And that's because we had a lot of Canadians helping. And the third one, um, the third one was, was a disaster, um, but it's for another reason. For the third one, it only cost us about $5,000 because we had Canadians helping. And the most recent one we built is, is in Kanunga. And that was supposed to be a $5,000 project, but it turned into a $15,000 project. And the reason this happens is it's all my fault, of course. But if somebody sends, sends, says, we want to build a school, and you say, all we have is $5,000, and they say, we can do it, and then I send them the $5,000, and then I start getting pictures of a school that's only partially built. So I can either have no school for $5,000, or I think I can have a school for 8000 And then it kind of keeps creeping up. And eventually I get the school, but it costs, you know, the Kanunga school costs three, uh, three times more than I thought it would. So that's a problem. And then so once you start taking care of, you know, uh, once you start getting into the construction business and you find out that everything's going triple budget, then you can't really do all the other things that you want to do as a, as, a, as a nonprofit, like maybe help women's collectives or maybe, um, you know, provide food or take care of the clinics or uh, uh, save, uh, help ex ex-Muslims in Sri Lanka, or all the other kinds of things that we do. Okay, this, this is the biggest pain in the butt in, in running these schools. Is, and of course I should see this coming, that as soon as you build a school, first off, when we work with school directors, they're not like peop a lot of them aren't people that decided, you know, I really want to be a school director. A lot of them are people that, des that decide, uh, I really want to get some money from Europeans. That sounds really cynical. But the best business, say, in Uganda might be a, uh, you know, a business with American backers, right? So they might think, well, you know, maybe I'll start a school. I, never, I don't really like kids, but I'll start a school. So, but the problem is the $15,000, say, to build a school, then it's never really over because then I keep getting emails that say, it's great that the school's built. By the way, all the kids have measles. Or, by the way, all the kids are hungry. Look at these hungry kids. And I get photos of the skinny kids. Uh, it's great that the school's built. Um, we can't pay the teachers, so the teachers are leaving. So it becomes this ongoing money pit. Has anybody ever owned a vacation home? Think of, think of 
a school, you know, in a, third, in a developing country as a vacation home in a, you know, on the Russian River. I actually had a vacation home on the Russian River, and I no longer have it. And so it's somewhat similar to this. This is a problem. Um, this is a huge problem. When we started uh, Cassisi Humanist Secondary School, that only cost us $5,000. But we were really excited about it because it was our first secondary school. So uh, we were so excited about it that I put together a, you know, a tour and I took three people over who, were, who had funded classrooms themselves. Um, and so we got there and we went to the school and there were only nine kids enrolled. So that was kind of horrifying that these poor people had paid. There's no reason for us to build four classrooms and spend $5,000 to have nine kids in the class. You know, why do you f nine kids need four buildings? And so that was, that was a real disaster. So that's a problem. If, you, if you're going to build a school, will there be any kids going there? And the one we built most recently that cost 15000 that one has 45 kids. I was, of course, I'm always told in the beginning, it's going to have 125 kids, it's going to have 75 kids, some big number, and then the kids don't show up. Or I get told something like, it only has nine kids because there's 40 orphans who want to go to the school, but they can't pay tuition. So can you send money so that the kids can go to the school? And then, you'll, then we'll have a lot of kids in the school. So that's, that's a problem. Okay. This one is really disappointing, and this is what you were mentioning here. And, uh, I mean, looking back on it, it's kind of obvious. Why would you build a humanist preschool? Do you know? Like, like these pre... I, I, I have actually run two preschools myself. Um, I don't think those kids... Uh, they're too young to make a commitment to humanism at that age or to even really understand it. You're laughing. It's obvious, isn't it? So, and unfortunately, um, the same is true of primary school kids, and unfortunately, we have decided the same is true of secondary school kids. There's no guarantee that a kid will go to a humanist secondary school and come out as a committed humanist. I have a sad story about that, which is that we're presently we decided to fund college students. So we, we took, we found two orphans that went to, uh, it's called um, Sir Isaac Newton Secondary Humanist School, and it's in Uganda, and we don't fund it. It's funded by this British organization. And uh, we found two orphans there that wanted to go to college and didn't have the money. So we gave them a full ride, full scholarship to college, and they're going to Mabara University of Science and Technology, full ride. My deal with them was, you're humanist, we want you to go to this school and start a, a humanist club. And they said they tried and nobody came. So that's disappointing. So we still got two kids there. And then one of the kids sends me an email, like they do, uh, saying, I've got my, be my best friend wants to know if you can help him also with his tuition. And I said, is he a humanist? You know, thinking, oh, there's a third humanist. <laughs> and he goes, no, no, he's a Pentecostal Christian. So it didn't work, right? So that doesn't work. So we have pretty much given up on trying to fund, trying to help kids become humanists. It's just really difficult. Also, the other problem is most kids, most parents in Africa, in Uganda, where our schools are, they will send their kid to a good school. Every school in Uganda is rated and actually our uh, humanist schools are highly rated, that they have pretty good teachers or better than the uh, competition. So they'll send kids there, but the, mostly they'll send their kids to a school that is convenient or has certain perks like free lunch, things like this. So the parents themselves aren't necessarily humanist and Unfortunately, at a lot of our humanist schools, I wish we could change this, but not all the teachers are humanists. In fact, at Cassisi Humanist Primary School, the head teacher is a Muslim woman. So, even, and then the reason for this is there simply aren't enough humanist teachers in Uganda to, uh, to, to, to staff all of our schools. So, anyway. 
Christian instead of Muslim? Because yeah, couldn't we? I could ask him to do that. His point of view, uh, his point of view is that he, you know, just because someone's humanist doesn't mean they're a great math teacher. And just because somebody is a Christian doesn't mean they're a great English teacher. He says this Muslim woman is the best teacher he has. So she's the head teacher. But, you know, of course I take my, my uh, funders over and they, they see this too. And we're just like, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think Christian would be any better than... Uh, the Muslims in Uganda are not probably any worse than the Christians in Uganda. The Christians in Uganda are famous for uh, gay-hating and uh, uh, they're, just a, they're just a difficult group. They're very fundamentalist Christians. What's the last one? Oh, okay. Well, this is just the problem with, do, you know, with any kind of charity work. If you give charity and it doesn't, and you're not staying on top of it and not making people strive to sustainability, you just create dependency, right? So it's sad, but we have a, there's a village there named Buhanga. It's like the most beautiful village. You have to like hike five miles up into the mountains, and then there's this beautiful village. And we've been funding it probably $25,000 for the last three years, which is a lot of money in Africa. And it just hasn't gone anywhere. It just it never gets any better. And, and they say that the number one income, the, the number one... Um, source of income in Uganda is nonprofit money, charity money. So this is, this is an extreme problem. Like if you've got a lot of people sitting around going, should I plant some corn or should I try to hustle money on Facebook? Okay. And a lot of times they decide I should try to hustle money on Facebook, right? So then they don't become sustainable. They're not like out there working all the time, you know, raising the chickens and the vanilla beans and the passion fruit and cuz Uganda is a great agricultural country you've you've basically told them yes there's a lot of money in the western world uh to help you so there's like a Uganda is a problem and a lot of times people who donate to us they end up being you know I, I put them on I say thank you online and the next thing they know they're getting all this email you know when people are trying to hustle money out of them okay so, is there a better way to promote humanism in Uganda? And so I'm going to go through some other things we've tried, and the answer is all no. Okay, setting up humanist orphanages. Uh, you think this is so funny. Okay, uh, okay, we set up two humanist orphanages. By the way, I'm, I'm going to repeat what I said. None of this is an entire failure. All of those humanist schools are operating. None of them close. They're all operating. They're all educating the kids well, they have high rankings. The kids are getting out of the school more likely to be humanist than kids that didn't go to that school. So, so they're, they're functional, okay? Uh, setting up human orphanages, we set up two. Uh, one of them is doing fine. The other one, there's a story that, that connects with what you said. We spent about $5,000 setting up an orphanage in this little town called Kenyenzi. We built a girls dormitory. Then we built a boys dormitory and then we gave it all solar electricity because that's really cool. And we, so we, we ended up with like $5,000 or $6,000. And then they stopped emailing me back for months and months and months. I just didn't hear from them. So I contacted a neighbor and they said, basically they said they turned Lutheran. <laughs> so what I think happened was some Lutherans showed up in the town and they said, oh, you've got an orphanage. Uh, that's kind of cool. What is it? And they said, uh, we're humanists. They go, they go, ah, you know what? We'll give you, uh, we got money. We'll give you $8,000. Just take down the sign, take down that bright Ken Yenzi humanist orphanage sign and put up Ken Yenzi Lutheran orphanage sign. Just take it down. We'll give you $8,000. You guys want to be Lutherans? Yes, yes. And that was the end. So that's a problem. The thing is, uh, the thing is about you, all of, you know, every African country is different. The thing is, is about Uganda, I have some, uh, uh, okay, like, I always ask people, like, why are you, a, why did you decide to become a humanist? So this one woman emailed me the other day, she's a, a leader of a women's collective, and she said, uh, 
the Christian religion told me to believe what I don't see, to believe in God, Jesus, and Holy Ghost. I was afraid. So I, that's kind of a weird answer. It's, it's probably some level of superstition there that she doesn't like believing in invisible things or something. Okay, this one I like. This is the most common reason why Ugandans become uh, humanists. The church told me to give offerings to the church leaders' blessings in turn. No blessings were received, and instead I saw church leaders eating the money and not taking it to heaven. Yeah. Right? So, basically, they regard uh, Christians and Muslim clerics as kind of like the witch doctors. You give them money, that, and, they're, and they're saying they're going to do something for you. You know, you're going to give them your money, or give them your chicken, or give them your goat. And they say some kind of thing is going to happen, like it's going to rain or something, and then nothing happens. And then you see them eating your money or something like that. So that's why, that's why in Uganda a lot of people will become humanists, because it's completely affordable. You know what I mean? It doesn't cost anything. In fact, you become part of this little small group uh, that might get like money from us. Um, okay, and the third reason she says is, I left Christianity because it was against my personal affairs, like having sex with my boyfriend. The Christian people told me it was a sin that will take me to hell. So that's another very common reason that we don't get in anybody's business that way. Um, I also want to point out that uh, humanism in Uganda now is immensely successful. There are many, many, like I'm going to say dozens of humanist organizations, or at least uh, they claim they're humanist organizations. There's dozens of them. I know that because they email me all the time. And it's not just me, there's other uh, international humanist organizations that are in Uganda, especially in western Uganda. So, uh, Uganda is the most humanist of all sub-Saharan Africa, and we, and we take some credit for, for that. But I think one of the reasons why it's worked in Uganda is there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of hate on you if you're a humanist in Uganda. Now, I'm going to talk more about that later. Setting up humanist clinics, is that a good way to do it? No, it's terrible. We set up like 15 clinics. Uh, there was really no reason to do it because Uganda has clinics already. Uh, we constantly had medicine stolen and condoms stolen from our clinics. And that was just, that was really a complete disaster. The biggest disaster was I have a wealthy donor in Canada who decided, I sent a letter, she wanted to donate 10000 at once to buy all this equipment for a one clinic, so we, we sent this one clinic $10,000, and it just never got there. You know, the director said he gave it to the medic. The medic said the director never gave it to her. Where to go, you know? So uh, that, was, that was horrible. That's probably the single worst thing that's ever happened to us. Okay, another dumb thing we did, convince existing schools to be humanists. This was a brilliant idea that I had, which was why build all these buildings and create humanist schools, if we can just kind of go into these other non-denominational private schools and say, do you want to be a humanist school? You know, and they'll say, and we'll give you $3,000, say, if you just become a humanist school. And they, doesn't that sound great? You don't have to do any of the building, and the staff's already there, and the kids already there. So we did that quite a bit. We talked about eight you know, non-denominational private schools into becoming humanist schools. And then we went there to tour them, and it was absolutely clueless and embarrassing because I had my funders with me. And one school, this was Mugete Junior School, they, sang, they got all the kids out and they sang us this great song called uh, God Bless the Humanists. <laughs> God Bless the Humanists. And then everywhere, when they went to another uh, humanist school that we had, you know, bought, and, uh, you know, the principal got up with her crucifix on and gave a big speech, and I was just like, oh, oh, oh. Okay, and setting up humanist centers, because we did set up a humanist center, but it didn't really work, because the guy we gave the money to, uh, he's not that interested, and uh, he basically turned it into a hotel, okay? Because there's more money in a hotel than a humanist center, right? Okay, so that's the orphanage that works. Uh, this is the Kenyenzi one that is now Lutheran. And is there an easier nation than Uganda to operate in? Anybody want to venture a guess? Any other nation 
Uh, okay, uh, well, here, here's some that we tried. Um, anybody think any of these look easy? I'll tell you what's wrong. Uh, Morocco, and this is interesting. I tried to work in Morocco because I wanted to go there, and I thought, that's going to work. Uh, it's a Muslim country. That, that's, it's the national religion. We could not even donate money. Do you know? Like I found a, I found a, a school that I found like the only school. It's like a high school where they offer English classes. I thought I could like, and the guy was sympathetic. He goes, "I cannot take money from your organization. You 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 advertise yourself as a humanist organization. I can't take money. I can't do it. This is Morocco. So any mo most Muslim countries, I cannot send. I can send money to individuals there, and we ended up sending money to a. Moroccan feminist atheist activist, uh, but I cannot build a school or start anything there. Tanzania, there just aren't enough humanists there to make it work. Malawi, there's one guy who goes around and tries to protect witches. Malawi's Malawi's the worst place uh, for witchcraft, and people actually do things like drag women into the street and burn them alive for being witches. And there's a humanist there who tries to protect them. He's a very brave guy named George Thindwa. But uh, I, I couldn't really work with him. He said, sure, you can work with me. Send me $5,000 and I will, uh, you know, I'll get a faster car or something like this. It just, it just wasn't going to work. Ghana was interesting. We did work in Ghana for a while. We taught like some um, uh, critical thinking classes. But Ghana, the humanists are kind of like college partiers. So the only humanists I'm in touch with in Ghana are like these kind of attractive 20-something people who just get together and, uh, you know, flirt with each other. It's, it's kind of Ghanaian or something. Uh, so we couldn't really work there. Nobody, they don't really care about proselytizing or building schools or doing anything. Sri Lanka is a really interesting country. We work with ex-Muslims uh, in Sri Lanka. They are actually, um, their Facebook page and their leadership is um, probably the leaders of the ex-Muslim m movement right now, just because there's a couple of people in that group that are just really articulate and really angry and really interesting. I don't know if you remember, about six months ago, there was a terrorist bombing in Sri Lanka. Hundreds of people were killed. So uh, although Sri Lanka is only like 9 or 10% Muslim, it's very dangerous to be an ex-Muslim there. So the people that we help there were ex-Muslims who had to, you know, they were fired from their job, they had to go into hiding, they had to leave town. So they're a great group, but we can't really operate in Sri Lanka because it's not really a developing country. It's too expensive for us. Uh, Haiti would be a great country to work in because I could fly there, I could get there really easily, but it's, it's, it's the humanist com community there is too small and too dysfunctional. I can't, I can't get any, oh, also, same with Morocco. I can't mail anything to Morocco or Haiti because it won't get there. I, I sent, the one thing I could do in Morocco was I sent them uh, a big box of National Geographics because this guy was begging, he goes, we don't, we don't have any science here at our school. Can you just send us National Geographics? We're fascinated by National Geographics. So I sent, it cost $148 to send him a box of National Geographics. Three months later, the box came back and just never got delivered. Maybe it's, really, maybe it's regarded as atheist material. It just was not delivered. Go ahead, question. Yeah. That way, um, with the Calvary Church in Los Gatos, we had a go team to Haiti. Ah. Yeah, but just helping the churches to do this and do that. Uh -huh. But it was hard for me because every time, early morning, late evening, in the middle 90s, high 90s, and then working outside, it was a little hard for me. Uh -huh. yeah. And also I had uh, questions, yeah, after the earthquake things there, was it after 10 years now or something? Uh, what did they do with all the money when they got a lot of money from other countries, yeah, but anyway. I, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of talk. I can tell it, you it that. It went through the Clinton Foundation and people that like the Clintons 
say yeah. it worked, and people who don't like the Clintons say the Clintons gobbled up all the money. They didn't. So I don't know. I, I've talked to Haitians about it. He said, uh, I talked to a wealthy Haitian in Piedmont. It was too hard for me there. <laughs> yeah, and he just said, oh, no, we don't like the Clintons in Haiti. I better get going a little faster. Appalachia is a really difficult place to work. Yeah, yeah. Because I couldn't, I could hardly find any atheists there. They're just not there. Uh, I would call people on the phone, and everybody just always would always. I would say, "Hi, I'm an atheist from California, and we'd like to help." And they would just start right in, like, "God bless you, dear. I, I miracles happen every day, you know." And I just couldn't find anyone. Turkey, the atheist groups, I could not. I found some Kurdish atheists, and I helped them, but it's kind of too expensive to operate there. S Lebanon, I found uh, a student group there, but they couldn't make any decisions. They had to be by consensus, you know, that kind of college thing. So that was too slow. And Nigeria, Nigeria is where we're actually working a lot. And Nigeria works great. I'm, so I'm going to talk about Nigeria quickly. As you probably know, upper Nigeria is Muslim, lower Nigeria is Christian. Uh, and uh, there's Boko Haram, uh, you know, that terrorist group. They're mostly like up here, like Where that. Where are you? Uh, we mostly work in Kaduna, like that. Okay, and that's because I work with, uh, oh, we started off doing um, critical thinking workshops there. This was a guy, uh, Abdul Rahman Aliyu, and he's like a closeted atheist, which most of the atheists in Nigeria are closeted. It's funny, that's the term they use. I'm in the closet. And so we had him teach critical thinking classes to, uh, to like, uh, Muslim schools. But you can, you can only go so far with that. You can't just stand up there and go, don't you think that Muhammad just made it all up? You can't really do that, okay? So that only went so far. We spent maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars teaching those critical thinking classes. There's a whole other thing that we did. Uh, there's a system in Nigeria called the Almajiri system, which is if you're a poor parent, you can put your kid, usually a boy, in a Muslim uh, Islamic center and he can get an education, but he's only going to learn the Quran. Okay? And 80% of Boko Haram is composed of graduates from the, this Almajiri system. Almajiri system. So we tried to help these Almajiri kids so they would not, oops, so they would not be just join Boko Haram. Here's some more pictures of Almajiri. Oh, this is, a, this is some boy we helped. He was an Almajiri boy. They were always mistreated. He had his hands tied behind his back. He stole the cell phone. He had his hands tied behind his back and uh, he got gangrene and he lost both arms. So we, we bought him some prosthetic arms. Uh, the Almadri kids are really mistreated, so we tried to help them. And then we, we helped refugee, refugees in a refugee camp. We bought them food. We got them uh, garbage cans to put water in. There's our Brighter Brains water. We got them a noodle factory. None of this is actually promoting humanism, though. Not really. We're just helping victims of Islamic extremism, right? So I, after a while, I was like, what can we do better? What is the best way to promote uh, humanism. Who, who I did, have a question. Go ahead. How did you help those uh, boys in the Islamic uh, school? Because for uh, me it's a question. How do you in Islamic school help them? Well, uh, the, boys are, the boys are really poor. They, um, they're basically taught the Quran four to six hours a day and then they're sent with bowls into the street to beg for food. So they're hungry. Uh, so we gave them food. They're also uh, cold and dirty, so we gave them blankets and um, clothes. And also, uh, the big problem is they, they don't have any life skills. They graduate from this, uh, the Islamic centers with no life skills. So we had a guy there who taught them vocational skills. Okay? For some reason, he was teaching them how to make detergent, you know, which is, I guess, a, a, a skill you can try to make some money at. And we're doing some other things. We have uh, a couple of humanists who own restaurants and they're hiring Almajiri boys to work in the restaurants. Okay? Um, does anybody know who this is? Leo Igwe? Have you heard that name? Anyway, he's a, he's a, big, uh, he's a big Nigerian atheist. We tried working with him but it didn't work. I contacted him and I said, uh, what would you do with a thousand dollars to promote humanism? And he said I would I would go on the radio a lot like that. So I gave him $1,000 and it kind of disappeared. He, 
he went to one town and checked into a hotel and ate some food in the restaurants and talked on the radio, and this, uh, the money went. So that didn't really work for us. We were looking for a way to, to really promote humanism successfully. So this is my hero. This guy's name is uh, Mubarak Bala. Has anyone ever heard of him? Mubarak Bala became famous, uh, semi-famous in that little world of ours about three years ago. He told, he, he told his dad that he was no longer a Muslim, that he was an atheist. So his dad, his uncles, and his brothers beat him up, and they threw him into an insane asylum, which is what happens to you in northern Nigeria. One of the options that happens to you if you say that, that you're an atheist. So, but he got out because somebody smuggled him in a, a cell phone, and then he started uh, contacting all these um, atheist bloggers, especially there's something called, there's a, a woman in Canada, she's called Atheist Mom or something. Anyway, they raised enough money to cause enough complaining to get him out. And so he is now head of Humanist Society of Northern Nigeria. And he's basically the top organizer of humanism in uh, Nigeria. So we work with him. We work with him a lot. So, and the way we work with him is I say, what do people in your group need, all right? And what they need is money. <coughs> And what happens, what happens when you come out as an atheist in Nigeria is you're probably going to lose your family members, right? You're going to lose your family members. You're probably going to get fired. You're going to get death threats for sure, and you may get beat up. But you're going to lose your job, right? That's the, that's the single thing they fear the most, all right? So a lot of the humanists in Nigeria don't have any money, they can't get employed, they need to be entrepreneurs. So I actually find that kind of exciting, like that. Uh, is anybody here voting for Andrew Yang? I, Andrew Yang is that thousand dollar, you know, a, a month guy. So anyway, I'm a big Andrew Yang supporter too, so this is like my way to be Andrew Yang in Nigeria. So what we do is we, uh, we give out $300 uh, entrepreneur grants, which is enough money for these um, humanists to do a variety of things. Let me just see what pit kind of pictures I have. Uh, it was enough, these two women, um, a great thing about Ni uh, Nigerians is ex-Muslims have different reasons, ex-Muslims in Nigeria have different reasons to become humanists than um, Ugandans. Uh, like a lot of the women in Nigeria say, I became a humanist because I don't like that thing in the Quran that says it's okay for my husband to beat me. Okay, they really don't like that. And also the uh, Nigerians are pretty well educated and a lot of them just say, uh, uh, Mubarak Bala said this, and a lot of them, they go, that, what's it called, the Hajj, when you go to Mecca? They go, I went to the Hajj, it was ridiculous. That was it. That was it. It was over for me. I guess I've never, of course, been to the Hajj, but I guess you go there and there's like, you got to pay money to do this, and everybody's running over here and getting trampled, and then you pay some money and you go over here. So that was it. And, uh, and then, of course, a lot of uh, Muslims, they don't like the extremism. They don't like the fact that you're supposed to hate everybody. They don't like Boko Haram. Anyway, so these two women, we gave them money and they uh, set up a propane uh, business, okay? And this is Mubarak Bala himself. He owns two restaurants. So we, we give him money to own his restaurants, and he hires um, Marjorie boys, a lot of them. This is a woman uh, who just runs a chicken farm. Uh, okay? This is a guy who's selling chicken. He's a humanist selling chicken. Okay? So $300 will do a lot. This is a seamstress. Okay? And this is a guy who's, I guess, making window frames. This, this is a woman who is, uh, runs a retail store. This guy's kind of interesting. Um, he's not very wealthy. He's just one of these uh, motorcycle taxi drivers. And he said, uh, if you give me $300, um, I will give uh, widows, uh, I, will give, I will give widows and single mothers half price rides. So we gave him $300, okay? These women own a restaurant. Uh, we also, you know, we didn't just completely bail on Uganda. We just told Ugandans, we're not building any more schools, but we're going to have entrepreneur grants for you. So this is a Ugandan, He's, but he is an ex-Muslim, and he has a mushroom business, right? And this is a tailor, this is a women's collective in Uganda. They have a tailoring service. This is a really great one. These are orphan boys, and they take uh, 
old car tires and they make sandals out of them. Okay, and this is uh, this is up in Buhanga. It's a catering service. Uh, there's a lot of those. Whoops, went the wrong way. Uh, this is a peanut farm in Niakiyambu. Can everybody see that pretty clearly? You see it pretty clearly. We stopped funding these people because I think they photoshopped this. Does that look photoshopped? They sent me like three of these in a row, and I kept asking, why are you photoshopped? It doesn't create a lot of trust, right, when you send people like photoshopped uh, images. So we stopped funding them because they have no reason and no answers, like why they're photo. Oh, uh, there you are. Uh, this is the uh, briquette uh, project, right? These are, you take like um, organic trash material, like newspapers, magazines, uh, corn husks, things like this, and you can make bio briquettes. It's great that you don't go out in the jungle and tear down the old growth and uh, burn it, okay, and keep the jungle intact. Here's some more. Um, a lot of, uh, this is the peanuts. These are all $300 projects. This is a Turkish group. This is just a Kurdish, Kurdish uh, folk music group. We gave them $300. And this is Congo, the Congo. If anybody wants to talk about the Congo, we just started funding there are 41 humanist groups in the Congo, and we just started funding them. And they're all in that war zone, Ebola zone. Uh, and we're helping them a lot, and it's, I'm finding it pretty easy to get funding for them. Okay, and we, I mentioned earlier that we provide a lot of transparency. Everybody we give money to has to like, send in a, a photo and a sign thanking their sponsors, right? So that's an example. Oh, the other thing we're doing besides that is I talked to Mubarak Bala and I go, is everybody like a, an entrepreneur? And he goes, no, we have a lot of humanists in college and they, ha they need funds to get through college. So if you could set up a humanist scholarship. All we give them is $120, uh, but that is probably about 30% of their tuition, right? So we're funding uh, Mostly, uh, mostly Nigerians and some people in the Congo. We giving, and most of them are in science. Mubarak Bala himself was—he's uh, a chemical engineer, or he was, and then he got fired. Now he's a restaurant owner. Um, this woman, I don't. Uh, she's in chemistry. Uh, I don't remember what he's studying. I have it all written down somewhere. She's in chemistry too. He is uh, geography is what he studies. This is a, a woman who was beaten by her husband, so she became a humanist. Uh, she's studying economics. Uh, I don't remember what he studies. Um, most of them are in science. Oh, he's in agriculture. Okay. She's in economics as well. She got full funding. The, a lot of these people are, um, I told you that they're closeted. So they're on my website, but they're hidden. And so I'm only going to open them for like, I'm only going to show their faces for like two days. And that's, that's when I send out the newsletter. And I'll, I'll send out the newsletter and I'll say, uh, oh, you, know, fund, you know, fundraising, two days only. Because they don't want their picture out there because they don't want everybody to see it. This guy's also hidden. Uh, okay. And she is in, she wants to be a teacher. Right. She's from the Congo. Her name is Scovia. She wants to be a biology teacher. And this is Rukia. And she wants to be a chemistry teacher. And that's Rukia C. So anybody who donates to us gets a nice, you know, gets this nice picture. Right. Okay. And that's it. Um, my name is Frederick. And I had a question. Uh, a lot of these new entrepreneurs might have had little to no like business experience, is there, is there any basic entrepreneur education that you provide to help them get going beyond the, the grant? That's a really good question. Um, we do actually, we used to offer entrepreneur workshops. And um, what I ought to do is just send them the workbook. I send them. A lot of these people, I'm going to say uh, two thirds of them are actually already ready running a business, but they just need some help. Like, say, this woman running a retail business. She likes, can I just give me $300 and I'll buy some stuff and I'll stock it and sell it for twice the price, you know. But there are, we, do get, we do get proposals from people that say stuff like, um, I've never done it, but there, I got a lot of neighbors making money at aquaculture, so I want to start selling fish. So, uh, yeah. Yes? A couple of points. 
First off, these are schools. Are these conventional schools? Do you teach the three R's, geography, botany, and all these other things as we do in this country? Mm -hmm. Is it very similar? You don't even don't mention the word God, for example. The, the humanist is kind of a philosophy, and I'm not sure how you can palm that off on kids. But if you treat them right, you may get somewhere. Now, my other question is, I see in the photograph, these fabrics, mm -hmm. do, they, do they have uh, cotton mills in, in, uh, uh, in Africa, or is this all imported stuff? Uh, what are the industries? Are okay. they really good industries? Yeah. Uh, the first question, um, uh, yeah, uh, the schools that, w that we built are... You know, they're, they're private schools. The public schools in Uganda are notoriously bad because they all have, uh, I should have showed you some photos, they all have like 80 to 100 kids in the classroom, which is, uh, there, might be a, there might be a room half this big with uh, 80 kids like sitting on the, on the dirt, and that's a public school. So a lot of people are willing to pay to send their kid to a private school, so that's what we have. Now... The high schools are not like, they're not really college prep. A lot of the high schools, most of the high schools are vocational high schools, okay? And that's where they learn things like uh, auto mechanics or hair weaving or, um, uh, you know, uh, hair cutting or basket weaving or things like this. In, in terms of your second question, um, there are a lot of really great handicrafts out of Uganda, uh, I've bought, a, I've bought a lot of baskets from there. The baskets are really valuable, and you can, you can probably find them around. And there's also a lot of, there's various kinds of cloth, Katengi cloth, Kikoi cloth, and they're really, it's really beautiful. Yeah, and they grow a lot of cotton. In fact, uh, the Bazoha Humanist Orphanage School is right next to a, to a huge cotton farm. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. It's great that you're giving these grants that are having so much effect. What about loans? Uh, years ago, there was a lot of support for microfinancing, mm -hmm. uh, giving loans mostly to women who then use it to buy a sewing machine and start a business, and they pay back, apparently, at very high levels, uh, very high percentages. Uh, do you do any of that? Uh, yeah, we did that for a while, and we're thinking of doing that again. Um, we did that in Uganda. And we had success in one place, uh, in, Bu in Buhanga. We've given the women's collective there uh, generally $1,000 at a time, and they always pay it back. So that's, that's been really successful. And then uh, in Kasese, it hasn't worked at all. And in another town called uh, in Kasese, we gave somebody $2,000, and we've gotten back $1,100. we are never going to get the other 900 back, you know. Uh, and in another town, we gave some guy a thousand to buy a pool table to start a business, and he never paid us back. So, but we might do it again because <coughs> one of the problems with these entrepreneur grants and, uh, is that um, I don't want people to apply every month. The same person to apply every month. So one thing I'm saying is, uh, well, after you get a couple, you can apply for a loan. Uh, there are some nonprofit difficulties with doing the loans that I have to figure out because when money starts coming into the nonprofit, it gets confusing. So I think if I ever did a loan, it would be like, uh, okay, we gave you $300 and you have to pay us back, but you're not going to give us the money. You're going to give the, mo the $300 to the next person who wants the loan. So I think, I think we might try to do that at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just my thing. Yeah, we're going to see. And the Institute... Pro the brighter brains. Are you checking them first before you work there? <laughs> Do they need it? Yes or no? Or they could say, no, we don't need it? Or what? Uh, huh? Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I, I, uh, brighter Brains Institute, uh, it's not exactly the right name for, for the nonprofit. I started the, I started the nonprofit. Uh, six years ago, and I called it the Brighter Brains Institute because I was very interested. I, I'm also an education writer, so I was interested in uh, education and things like this, but various things that we funded um, 
weren't working. Like I was trying to like, you know, criticize uh, football in high school and things like this. And so everything kind of dropped out. Like nobody was interested. I couldn't raise funding for anything other than this. So our our website now is actually called Humanist Global, and. Uh, uh, I call it a project of the Brighter Brains Institute. But I can't change the name of the nonprofit. That's like, it just can't be done. That's too difficult. Quite, okay. Uh, I note that uh, the Bill Gates Foundation is very active in Nigeria and eradicating polio. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you've made any uh, notices that Bill Gates is a non believer and tried to hook up with his organization? Um, yeah, he is a non-believer. Um, um, we haven't tried to hook up with his organization. Uh, we probably should. I, I might have written, them a, written a grant to them at some point. Yeah. Um, I, the interesting thing about Nigeria, uh, there's a lot of interesting things about Nigeria. Does anybody know the population of Nigeria? Anybody? What? No. Two hundred million, two hundred million, and by the year twenty one hundred, there's supposed to be more Africans on Earth than everybody else combined, because Africa is a is a is a uh, uh, wildly uh, fertile continent. Um, so, but an interesting thing about Nigeria, Nigeria also has one of the the, the hugest um, income disparities in the world. And it has a really low life expectancy. It's like something like 51.6, meaning all of us would have been dead a long time, you know, if we were Nigerians. It's just that people there don't. So they have a lot of health issues. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Dick Hewitson. Um, I'm also concerned about parallels. Are you familiar with Finca, F-I-N-C-A? I've, I've heard of it, but I don't remember what they do. Because did. I've been giving to them for years, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, give uh, loans and grants to women in third world countries mm -hmm. to start uh, to be entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering if you'd heard of them or what you thought of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We are, I am in touch with a group called Women's Microfinance Initiative, and they are, I think, a... Uh, Kenya and Tanzania microfinance group. And uh, I've been pushed a little bit to organize um, women's microfinance in Uganda. Um, but I'm just, but that would mean dropping all the humanism and everything like that. We actually are ineligible for quite a few grants because you have to, you have to write like, is everybody eligible for your funding? And I have to write no, only humanists are eligible for our funding, and they go, "Well, that's you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to give you any money." And that happens to us quite a bit. So we are a hundred percent of our funding comes from individuals. So uh, I want to first thank you for uh, helping those uh, ex-Muslim. Oh yeah. Because I feel that that is one of the points that really we should uh, put more money because those people who dare to go against the tradition and the culture and the religion lose a lot and needs a support from someone mm -hmm. and it's good to be there for them and i think also women is very good uh, group to help them and loan to to women that um, but when i am listening to you uh, maybe i came late and i don't know your background I am just like a straightforward. I feel that is a naive American or naive Westerner that uh, doesn't know about the corruption and kleptocracy of those countries and go and think that just can make build the uh, schools and people become humanist and so on. And my question is that how much did you study about the mentality and the way of people functioning and the society before that you give the money to the groups? Uh, right, okay, um, let me go back to some of the early stuff you talked about, the ex-Muslim thing. Yeah, I'm really attached to uh, helping ex-Muslims. It's something I like to do a lot. Um, I can only do whatever my funders want to do. I can say, uh, I can say our average funder uh, 
doesn't always want to fund what I want to fund. The average funder, unfortunately, wants to. They they really they really like to help orphans, which is such a mess, and and and, the, and they like to help. Uh, I like to help women's collectives, and I'm fine with that. But I, I have trouble raising money just to help, like, say, one ex-Muslim from Bangladesh needs to escape. And I, that's, that, that's always difficult for me to raise money for. Um, but I like helping the ex-Muslims. And I think it's a, I think it's, I, I don't know if people here are aware of it, but uh, ex-Muslims in Bangladesh, for instance, uh, leaders, bloggers, atheist bloggers, um, often just killed you know, people knock on their door and then run in and stab them to death. Um, I get a lot of uh, email from uh, ex-Muslims, you know, that are in hiding or want to get away. There is a, there is a, I have a, f a friend, uh, Center for Inquiry has an organization called Secular Rescue, and they help, um, ex they try to help ex-Muslims. They're a little slow at it, so I kind of work with uh, Center for Inquiry, like somebody will contact me and Center for, uh, for Inquiry and say, uh, I'm in hiding, uh, I'm homeless in uh, Oman or something like that. I need money right away. And so uh, my organization is capable of sending them like $300 or $500, I can do that instantly. Center for Inquiry can send them $5,000 in like three weeks. So I can kind of keep them alive until they get the Center for Inquiry money. Um, back to your question, uh, you had another, helping women, women's groups is, is great, and, and I would say I've, uh, I have a lot of funders who just, who just love to do that. There's problems with it, though. In Uganda, there, it's really common uh, to uh, have men posing as leaders of, of women's groups. Uh, uh, they, they set up a fake email, their name is, they have a f female name and everything, and then you find out that uh, it's a guy who's just like making money off Americans who want to fund women's collectives. That, that happens, uh, I'm going to say 50 or 60% of the time. And sometimes, it ha and sometimes it, there's problems like I'll wire them money and it won't get delivered because I thought the phone was under the woman's name that I was given, but the phone number is under a man's name. And so uh, World Remit or Use Remit will not deliver the money, and then the money's in limbo, and I never get it. So there's tons of problems working with uh, women's collectives in Uganda. Uh, the last question, I'm lucky I have, a, I have a friend who's been running a nonprofit in Kenya for uh, five years. And he's always, he's always telling me stories about just horrible corruption. And he's, and he's warned me over and over again. He'll just say things like, the people you trust the most, they're going to turn on you. You know, and stuff like that. Or he'll just say, Hank, I got to tell you, if you can get through the first five years of making incredibly stupid mistakes, you might be okay. So we are actually uh, in our sixth year. And, uh, and I remember his name's Jake. And... Uh, I always remember that he said the first five years you're just going to be an idiot, and so we've, we're kind of moving past that. And I and I never really I went to Uganda. It didn't really help. It doesn't really help. But I did go to Uganda first when I thought about start you know sending a lot of nonprofit money to Uganda. I went there first and I met everybody, and uh, and I trusted them. And it, it you can meet them, and it doesn't really always work. I mean, I, we just did some, we gave this one guy, you know, you can go to this place that you gave a lot of money to, and my brother is a big donor to us, and I think he bought a hundred pigs for, like, this, this school, and we get there, and they show us five pigs, and, and my brother loved the pigs. He's like, oh, these are great pigs, and he goes, where's the other 95, and they're, and they're like, ah, oh, they're over that mountain, and the car's broken, and I think there was a flood and the roads washed out. We can't show you the other 95. And my brother was just like, okay. And we went to another, we went to the next town and, and where we had, we bought like 475 chickens. And we see about 50 and they're like, ah, the other chickens, they're, they're, they're all in different people's houses because we don't have a place big enough, blah, 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 blah. So it's tough. But what I think what we do now works because we don't send a lot of money to any one individual. We send it only to people who are already risking their lives because they've put their faith on our website as a, as a humanist in Nigeria. 
and that's dangerous. So the risk, and, they're, and plus they're paying dues to the Humanist Association. So they're making a big risk, and we're sending them $100, and they've been vetted by Mubarak Bala because, I st of course, I still get, you know, I still get applications, and I have to check them all with Mubarak Bala. I go, do you know this guy? He'll go, he's not a humanist. I don't, he's not in our organization because, like I said, there's people on Facebook all the time that are like, you know, putting in applications here and putting in applications there. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead. Okay, this will have to be the last question then. I was just wondering what percent of Africa has internet so they can communicate with you. Uh, I would say they, uh, it's pretty good. I mean, there are villages that sometimes we'll, I won't hear from for a while. And, um, and, um, and they'll say the internet was down, you know, Nyaka Yumbo or Buhanga or something. But honestly, uh, you know about mobile money? The Africans are way ahead of us on mobile money. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't have to send them money to their bank or anything. They got like these use remit and world remit. And certain people like Muber, a lot of them have, you know, a lot of them just have smartphones like we do. Uh, they're probably put together like Cuban automobiles or something. You know what I mean? Like they're just, everybody knows how to like buy these little parts from this guy and that guy. And everybody's got like their smartphone. And a lot of these people... Uh, they'll tell me, um, I, always, uh, I always email you right back because I have my phone set up so that if you email, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll email you right back. So I have, and we have a rule that if I don't hear back from you in 48 hours, we're probably not going to fund you like that. Because I have, you know, I want, our, I want anybody who funds us to feel like, you know, their money got there really quick and they got the thank you back really quick. So... Uh, yeah, so everybody's pretty online. 